Okay, welcome everybody. Um, uh, if you could take your seats, we'll get going. Um, so, welcome and thank thank you everyone for coming to this first night of Law on Trial. Uh, my name's Sarah Keenan, and um, I'll be chairing tonight's session on the Islamophobic University. Uh, so, as of the first of July, which is uh, in about two weeks' time, Schedule Six of the Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015 will come into force for England and Wales. Under this new legislation, universities will become specified authorities that have particular counter-terrorism and security duties. Specifically, universities must, in the exercise of their functions, have due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. That's reading from the Act. The Secretary of State may issue guidance to universities about the exercise of their duty to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism and may require universities to provide information on how they are discharging that duty. As we will hear tonight, uh, not only does the Act represent a new level of compulsory involvement for universities in the British government's counter-terrorism and security agenda, it has also been passed at a time when hostility toward and fear of Muslims as potential terrorists and security threats is evident in public institutions and in public space, both in the UK and throughout Western Europe. What will this new duty mean for universities as they carry out their role of encouraging students to think critically about the world, to explore and debate ideas that might be unpopular in mainstream culture, and to express themselves clearly and confidently? The Act includes a section requiring both the Secretary of State and universities that she's giving guidance to, to have regard to the protection of freedom of speech and academic freedom, which are of course values that the university is supposed to hold sacred. However, in recent months in particular, it has been notable that freedom of speech has been used as a rallying cry not for challenging mainstream views and popular bigotries, but for proclaiming them in ways that are highly offensive to minoritized communities. What can freedom of speech mean in the classroom when universities are legally required to carry out work for British counterterrorism and security forces? So this evening we're fortunate to have four speakers to explore these questions and the idea of the Islamophobic University from a range of different perspectives. So we're going to start with Nadine Elanani, who is a lecturer here at Birkbeck. Um, and then we have Azu Morali from the Islamic Human Rights Commission, Sohel Shicha from the University of Lyon, and Malia Boatia, who is Black Students Officer of the NUS. Um, and just to let you know that afterwards there is a free drinks reception um, in B04, so please join us if you have time. Okay, so Nadine. So, um, I'm just gonna jump straight in. I'm gonna be talking about liberal Islamophobia and the Je suis Charlie uh, hashtag, um, and also the UK counter terror um, the recent counter-terror legislation that, that um, relates to universities um, and how this um, forms part of the government's counter-terror strategy which is resulting in a, or taking the form of a new McCarthyism. So I'm going to start by having a look at this cartoon. Many cartoons and satirical responses emerged in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo attacks. The one I found most striking was of a young, brown, perhaps Muslim man standing spread-eagled against a wall while a uniformed police officer searches his pockets. In a speech bubble, the young man protests, Je suis Charlie. The police officer's response is, yeah, yeah, me too. For me, this cartoon seems to capture the essence of the hypocrisy and emptiness of the Je suis Charlie hashtag. It shows an instance of the everyday enactment of racist structural violence by the state against young black and brown people. It exists in the shadows, in the side street, suggested by the grey background the cartoonist has chosen. There is no spotlight here. There is no media interest. Nobody is watching. But it is nevertheless a very real backdrop to the image of national unity in France and across Europe that was widely projected following the Charlie Hebdo attacks. Looking at this cartoon, we understand that this is an everyday occurrence. This is just another white police officer in uniform stopping and searching a racially profiled profiled young brown man. It is an unsettlingly familiar image. This young man in protest invokes the spirit of national unity that swept through France following the Charlie Hebdo attacks. His movement is restricted, but he turns his head towards the officer, appealing to him, Je suis Charlie. The police officer, eyes cast downwards, is concentrating on patting the young man down. We can almost hear the wry, dismissive, mocking tone in his response. 
Where, where? Moi aussi. Yeah, yeah, me too. The white police officer may be seen as embodying the state. Despite the apparent show of national unity, it is business as usual here. And that involves the state's ritualized everyday enactment of structural oppression. The tone of the police officer's response is also one of disbelief. Sure, you're Charlie. Yeah, right. This is indicative of the catch-22 position French Muslims find themselves in. They are obliged to be Charlie because if they are not, they are demonstrating their opposition to French liberal values and indeed perhaps even supporting terrorism. But at the same time, if they say they are Charlie, they are disbelieved. There is a constant air of suspicion around the veracity of their condemnations of the attacks and their identification with Charlie. And indeed, this seems to be borne out statistically. A recent poll found that 74% of French citizens believe that Islam is incompatible with French values. So in this talk, I want to focus um, on some of the implications of the counter-terror discourse legislation operations for people of color in Europe, particularly those racialized as Muslim. I'm going to begin by setting out some recent legislative developments, examining in particular the 2015 Counterterrorism and Security Act as an optic through which to understand the new McCarthyism that is today threatening British institutions and those who come into contact with them. I will then examine the response to the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris as a lens through which to explore what Deepa Kumar has termed liberal Islamophobia. Finally, I will say a few words on the scope and meaning of resistance to these trends. So to begin with, a few words on how the government's, the UK government's strategy of prevention of radicalization is one of co-option and how this results in a new McCarthyism. Both in the US and in Western Europe, policies have been designed to solicit the support of teachers and community members who are to be turned into a McCarthy-type informant system. But this informant system stretches much further than the Muslim community. In the UK, the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act makes it an obligation for state-funded organizations such as universities, schools and councils to combat extremism and prevent radicalization. Local authorities are, for instance, to put in place panels to which those individuals vulnerable to being drawn into terrorism could be referred. All specified authorities delimited in the Act are to have due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. If discovered to be uncooperative in, in this duty, universities could be subject to direction by the Secretary of State and ultimately a mandatory court order backed by criminal sanctions for contempt of court. Universities will be required to train all staff who have contact with students to recognize those who may be vulnerable to being radicalized. James Brokenshire, Minister for Security and Immigration, has helpfully, or perhaps not so helpfully, informed Parliament that the indicative elements for, for being one of these vulnerable individuals is to appear withdrawn and reserved, and perhaps showing other personality traits. How many of our students would fit this description, a rather broad description? The explanatory notes to the Act make clear that the principal terrorist threat is currently from Al-Qaeda-associated groups and from other terrorist organizations in Syria and Iraq, and that's quoting the explanatory notes. This suggests that Muslims are to be the principal target of the new procedures required by the Act, and thus raises a concern that the Act will result in a disproportionate and discriminatory targeting of Muslims. Extremism is, divine, it is defined in the... It's, defi it's defined in the... Can't, <laughs> is defined in the government's prevent guidance as vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. At a recent event in London organized to assess the implications of the legislation, Sita Balani, a researcher and tutor at King's College in London, expressed her concern at the worryingly vague nature of this definition and questioned whether she, would, she could legitimately continue to teach her courses, which include introducing students to critiques of common sense, imperialism, and indeed of so-called British values. Can we conceive of the act as a form of censorship? In 1983, Susan Sontag said, our society does not censor as totalitarian societies do. On the contrary, our society promises liberty, self-fulfillment, and self-expression, but many features of our so-called culture have as their goal and result the reduction of our mental life. And this is precisely what censorship is about. It is clear that the goal and result of this particular legislation is to police the speech of a racialized group, Muslims. 
We have seen the effects of this policing of Muslims in other contexts. For instance, the recent swift and brutal way in which the media vilified officials of the NGO CAGE after a number of its spokespersons suggested that some responsibility for the radicalization lies with security services on account of their harassment of young Muslim men. The government's Prevent Duty Guidance, issued in March 2015, states that staff members of universities are to look for changes in behavior and outlook of students in their monitoring of them to detect signs of radicalization. Yet the years spent at university are often a transitional period in the lives of young people, during which they experiment with new ideas and come to realizations about themselves and life paths ahead. Don't all students display changes in behavior and outlook while at university? Is that not the sort of open, critical outlook and thinking we encourage in our students? As tutors, we rightly tend to conceive of our role as one of supporting rather than spying on our students. Indeed, it may become difficult for students to feel comfortable approaching support services at universities if they are concerned that they are the subjects of surveillance. Relationships of trust and intellectual communities are at risk of breaking down. Measures stipulated in the PREVENT guidance which suggest a ratcheting up of surveillance include putting in place oversight committees for prayer rooms and identifying and addressing issues of scrutiny and policing of activities of supposedly democratic students, unions and societies. According to the guidance, these, need to ha these, um, these societies need to have clear policies setting out activities that are or are not allowed to take place on campus. Online materials that are accessed for non-research purposes are also to be monitored. So, what I want to say in this paper is that we can see this legislation um, as being indicative of a liberal Islamophobia that is currently pervasive across European societies today. While right-wing Islamophobes believe that there are no good Muslims, liberal Islamophobes differentiate between different types of Muslim. According to the dicta of liberal Islamophobia, it recognizes there are good and there are bad Muslims. In the UK Home Secretary Theresa May's words, those bad Muslims are those who reject our values, including democracy, the rule of law, and equality between citizens. Those who believe that it's impossible to be a good Muslim and a good British citizen. In her speech to the Conservative Party in October 2014, May outlined a counter-terrorism strategy that entails the blacklisting of individuals and organizations to be identified by a new extremism analysis unit. Although she denied that the strategy is picking on Islamist extremists, all the examples she gives relate to tackling these through surveillance and co-opting co workplaces, hospitals and schools. Deepa Kumar has observed, this is the modus operandi of liberal Islamophobia, to roundly reject Islam bashing and then to proceed to institute proposals that target Muslims. And we saw this dynamic played out in the form of the UK Counterterrorism and Security Act and its likely disproportionate effect on Muslim students. We also saw it significantly and recently in the case of France, where we saw the archetypal manifestation of liberal Islamophobia following the Charlie Hebdo killings. There, we saw a backlash against Muslims whereby the mantle of free speech has been used to target them. In this way, free speech is instrumentalized in defense of racism. The discourse is one of the West needing to preserve and protect liberal values against those who seek to destroy them. It is the notion of the enemy within, the bad Muslim who lives among us, those who do not, dissim who, who do not assimilate and threaten Europe as the land of the Reformation and the Enlightenment of Voltaire and Kant and of a number of great revolutions, each of which inscribed on its banners progressive and universalist goals, such as liberté, égalité, and fraternité, all encapsulated today in the Je suis Charlie hashtag to which I now turn. Charlie Hebdo defended its publication of racist cartoons on the grounds that it was adhering to an idealized, secular, liberal vision of free speech with no limits, except, of course, the limits imposed by the French state and the particular sensitivities of its friends and allies. For while Charlie Hebdo's Islamic cartoons have been fervently defended on free speech grounds, Charlie Hebdo itself fired one of its writers for refusing to apologize for making an anti-Semitic cartoon about President Sarkozy's son, and France last year became the first country to, to ban pro-Palestinian demonstrations. In the three weeks following the attack, there were 257 legal cases of people accused of condoning or provoking terrorism in France, the vast majority against Muslims. Around 41 of these have been fast-tracked through the courts, and 18 people have been given prison sentences. As Sarah Keenan and I have argued, 
This poorly defined, often contradictory vision of free speech is significantly easier to exercise and indeed laugh along with for those whose identities do not render them vulnerable to hate speech, police harassment and other forms of structural violence. The most popular and celebrated means of defending free speech in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo killings was through the use of the Je suis Charlie hashtag as a means of showing solidarity not only with the victims but also with Charlie Hebdo and what the magazine stands for. That is, not the actual content necessarily, but its right to publish that content. This show of solidarity with, or more accurately, the identification as the magazine at a time when its writers had been subjected to lethal violence, send a very strong signal of unwavering defiance in the face of the perceived threat that terrorism presents to Western societies and their hard-won and hard-defended liberal freedoms. Along with the Je suis Charlie tag, another one emerged, that of Je suis Ahmed. Ahmed Meribet was the Muslim police officer who was killed by the Charlie Hebdo attackers. This tag celebrates the heroism of that officer in dying in defense of Charlie's right to ridicule his faith and culture. This is in line with and feeds the assimilative discourse surrounding the place of Muslims in, in the French state. The good Muslims can stay. The good Muslim is she who assimilates, she who apologizes, she who hangs her head in shame, condemns her jihadi compatriots, and makes herself as little I identifiable as Muslim as possible on a day-to-day -day basis. But the best Muslim, the perfect Muslim, the ideal Muslim, however, is the martyr. A martyr for the French state a martyr who dons a police uniform and dies protecting the country's glorified liberal values. The dominant discourse can be captured as such. Good Muslims behave like this, and bad Muslims behave like that. Muslim scholars around the world have made clear that the Paris attacks are un-Islamic. So why are the Charlie Hebdo killers identified primarily as Muslim killers rather than as individuals who affiliate and propagate a dangerous and murderous political ideology? Why are white supremacists such as Andes Breivik, who in his manifesto describes himself as 100% Christian, not portrayed as bad Christians? It was telling that following the attacks, the French state committed 1 million euros to keep Charlie Hebdo up and running. With this very visible display of unity between the French state and the magazine, down comes the already loose and slipping facade that the French Republic is built on the principle of equality. Except, of course, in the most formal sense. Here is the state explicitly and publicly sponsoring a vision of free speech that sees no structural oppression and sees no power, that sees no abuses of that power and sees no silenced and marginalized minorities, no victims of imperialist wars, such as those raised by France in Algeria, Afghanistan, Mali and Iraq. For the French state, it was of course a convenient spin on the atrocity, that it could play the role of the knight on horseback riding onto the scene to rescue Western civilization from barbarity. An unprecedented number of world leaders and state representatives joined the French in proclaiming Western liberal values on a solidarity march through Paris, which took place on the Sunday following the attacks. The prize for these states in ingratiating themselves with Je suis Charlie is the legitimation and expansion of their power. But lost in the cacophony of Je suis Charlie's was any sense that it was not in fact the purported freedoms at stake but an understanding of how the hypocrisies of the liberal state sustain a system which perpetuates violent structures of oppression. So a few words by way of conclusion on resistance. Hamid Dabashi has described the racism against Muslims in North, American, North America and Europe as unabated and growing. With this in mind, one of the most insidious aspects of the Je suis Charlie hashtag was the appropriative form in which it appeared. It consists of a strategy of showing solidarity through identification with the victim, or rather as the victim. As Sarah Keenan and I have argued, in this way, it can be considered as an appropriation of what was a creative and subversive tool for fighting structural violence and racist oppression, perhaps most famously in the I Am Trayvon Martin campaign. When young black men stood up and said, I am Trayvon Martin, they were demonstrating the persistent and deeply entrenched demonization of black people, which not only sees them killed in the street on their way to the local shop, but also deems their killers innocent of any wrongdoing. When predominantly white people in France and around the world declare Je suis Charlie, they are not coming together as fellow members of a structurally oppressed and marginalized community regularly subjected to violence, poverty and harassment and hatred. Rather, they are banding together as members of the majority, as individuals whose identification with Charlie Hebdo 
however well-meaning, serves to reproduce the very structures of oppression and marginalization that allowed the magazine's most offensive images to be consumed and celebrated in the first place. These are the same structures that saw Parisian police massacre hundreds of Algerians attending an independence protest in 1961, the same structures that breed the racialized poverty and police harassment that led to the 2005 clichy sous bois riots, the same structures that allowed the ban on the burqa and the hijab. In the face of censorship, surveillance, and the existence of a climate of fear backed by criminal sanctions, coupled with a constant rejection by one's own country as being not integrated or not belonging, as well as the appropriation of means of resistance, it is more important than ever to think carefully about whether and how victims of structural violence can articulate their victimization, as well as formulate critiques and modes of resistance. I have not had time to do this here, however I would like to end by mentioning one heartening image that I saw during the days of the anti-Muslim Reclaim Australia demonstrations that took place recently. Here we can see the Aboriginal Australian flag and on it is written, not yours to reclaim. And next to it, another sign addressing Australia's Muslim population saying, you are welcome here. This intervention draws attention to the particular settler colonial context in which these racist demonstrations are taking place, reminding the Islamophobes that they came here as part of a British colonial exploit and committed genocide, and that they remain in colonial occupation of indigenous lands. It also consists of an important show of solidarity between differently situated groups who are victims of state racism and structural violence and shows how strength can be drawn from acknowledging oppression and connecting struggles against structural violence and oppression. Thank you. Thanks, Nadine. So now um, we'll hear from Azu Morali. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much to the organisers for this invitation. I really appreciate it uh, on many levels. First of all, I've read a lot of your work and I really do appreciate the contributions that you've been making on a personal level, professional level and so on and so forth. And it's nice to be in a situation where you can take certain things for granted when you're talking and not have to explain yourself from you know, less than zero. Uh, I'm from the Islamic Human Rights Commission as I was introduced, and uh, people walking down Gower Street who walked past me this evening probably thought they were walking past someone who should be taken into some kind of custodial care, because I was laughing a fair bit, largely because the last time I walked down from Euston Square to Burbeck was on September or October last year, I forget the precise date, uh, because I was coming on a site visit with a colleague to look at uh, both uh, rooms here and at UCL for our conference we were organizing in December on institutional Islamophobia. Uh, we booked here, we turned down this room actually, we went upstairs, I think it was both lighter and if I'm honest, cheaper. And um, uh, we were expecting about 50, 60 people towards the date of the actual conference, which was I think the 13th, it was the Saturday anyway of December. We found quite a lot of extra people were RSVPing uh, we'd already booked a room, extra room for prayers. I sent a couple of colleagues down who were managing logistics with a measuring tape because we'd forgotten to measure the lectern for the right size poster and to ask you know, someone in the administrative office about you know, whether we could accommodate people in that room or should we rebook the lecture theatre, etc. Uh, I won't go into too many details of what happened next because it will take up my whole 15 minutes. There is just so many examples of... Uh, hypocrisy, Islamophobia, double standards, all the things that Nadine was averring to in terms of the pressures that happen on uni in university spaces. So you can look it up online, just put in something like Islamophobia Conference Burbeck and it, uh, it will come up. There's been a lot of hoo-ha. My colleagues were sort of dragged to one side by somebody working in the administration side of, of this college into a meeting with a prevent officer from Camden Council I don't know if people are familiar with what a prevent officer is, but we could probably describe it further in, in Q&A. Uh, and I forget now whether a member of the police was there or whether they were just referring to advice they had taken from the police. Uh, and they advised my colleagues that uh, they were rather concerned about the going ahead of this conference. Because, uh, not because Britain First had actually threatened to have a demonstration outside because of the conference. Britain First, as you know, being a right-wing so-called street movement, uh, supposedly, just 
you know, protesting political Islam, but I think, you know, as with the EDL and everyone else, we know what it's all about. They were actually rather concerned that uh, one of the SOAS student societies had decided to do a counter demonstration against Britain first, and they were worried about violence from the SOAS, whichever student society it was, I think it was the anarchist society. During this conversation in which police advice, etc., etc., was given, my colleagues were asked, well, why on earth would you want to think of an academic institution for your conference anyway? And that's what I want to focus on. Because at the time, obviously, we were rather angry and uh, all the academics who were actually speaking at our conference were quite livid and have written all sorts of letters of protest subsequently to highlight the fact that A, they are academics and B, what the hell is going wrong here? But for me, that question is really, really illuminating because it highlights some of the assumptions we have and even for a while I was I was rather shell-shocked in that how on earth could that question be asked of us when you know all the publicity is there the lineup of the conference is there we have academics from the US from from London you know outlining their thinking nothing was in that sense particularly unknown when I started calming down and kind of uh, deconstructing what had happened it it made me realise, and you know, bear in mind this was before the CTS bill was rushed through Parliament, so we didn't actually know such a thing was going to happen at the time we organised the conference. We all have, however decolonial someone like myself likes to think they, they are, an idea of the university space. That space where young people come and have the opportunity to form their ideas, to mature, to you know, evaluate things, etc., etc. It's one of those precious life experiences if you can get it get it you know it's dare I use the word aspirational okay when you think about it and I did think about it a lot because the organization I work with has been around for nearly 20 years and those of us who helped set it up of which I am one had been working in casework advocacy uh, legal campaigning etc for in different projects the one thing that's been going on, or one of the many things that we've seen over and over again, are cases related to the university space. And you're programmed to think of all of these types of cases as aberrations, okay? Aberrations to the wonderful norm of the aspiration. You know, the idea is if you fix that, if you set the case law, if you bring a challenge, you can fix what's going wrong, okay? When you start thinking about it, you have to start asking the question, not how did an officer here ask such a ridiculous question of two people at the Islamic Human Rights Commission, but really when, ever, when has there actually been a proper space for Muslims or minoritized others in the Western, westernized university setting to actually exist? Now that doesn't mean obviously that there are no Muslims or minoritized others or different thinkers in that university space, but how have they ever been allowed to exist and express themselves? And I go back now to my uh, my own university days. I was going to say this happened to a friend of mine, but it actually happened to me, so I might as well be honest, but it's happened to quite a lot of other people since, at least in terms of cases that have come to us. I was a student of English literature, uh, and I found out in my first year from a friend that she'd been approached by my director of studies uh, who'd asked her, or who'd actually not asked her, just had a chat with her as if it was the most normal thing in the world about how she didn't think I'd be able to understand English literature because I wasn't a Christian, uh, an English Christian, I beg your pardon. Um, to which my friend, who was an English Christian, said, well, I'm pretty sure she's got a better hold of this subject than I have, which was rather fantastic. But anyway, the situation escalated uh, with this kind of increasing pressure on the idea of why is this particular person in this space? Okay, and we have had endless kind of cases of that, and it's not just us as an organisation. You can look at the literature, you can look at how people like Shirin Rizak will point out there isn't a space for the existence of what we've studied as Muslims, but actually any type of other, as is deemed by the liberal space, to exist except in that of the subservient other, if you like, or the uncritical other. So we are not seeing in the last 30 years a kind of if you like, Islamic response to, I don't know, legal theory. We have critical race theory, and that itself is under pressure. Critical legal uh, race theory, literary theory. But within that, the Muslim identity is pushed out. Why? 
because we have the idea that there isn't a Muslim narrative that can fit into that. And even Muslims themselves repeat that. You know, we have been self-censoring for a long time. For goodness sake, you know, could you imagine talking about a Muslim perspective on law? No, nobody dares do that. People have that those ideas, but they just cannot express them. Now, this didn't start 30 years ago. It didn't start with the Rushdie affair, from which I remember as an 18-year-old being kind of thrown into this maelstrom of things that I saw many of them repeating earlier this year. We have to keep going backwards and backwards to see the problems of this setting, which is a microcosm of all the things that we were talking, Nadine was mentioning earlier, about the kind of structural violence being enacted, if you like, over there, but which actually finds its root over here. And what we've been seeing is the churning out of colonial narratives worldwide actually now really re being re-emphasised internally because now we have a populace of brown, black or however else differentially marked faces coming through that university space. So on the one hand, you may fit quotas or you may not fit quotas when it comes to you know tick boxing diversity, but we have less and less, and I really like that Sontag quote, actually, that was really just so spot on, the reduction of the space of thinking. And that has been part of the process of the westernized university setting, and it's time, I think, for us to kind of debrief ourselves on that. Otherwise, we're stuck in a kind of knee-jerk reaction. And, you know, these are my thoughts in closing for the, if you like, a call to action. Because, yes, I mean, my organization, so many are mobilizing, trying to work with unions, etc., on the implications of the CTS Act. And inshallah, you know, let's pray that there's some kind of resistance or hope there's some kind of resistance that can be mobilized. But ultimately, we're still trying to fix something that's so broken that we actually need to reimagine how to articulate, how to create spaces that are actually inclusive. Because without that, this CTS bill, CTS Act may collapse, although I have to say, and I don't want to be overly pessimistic, but uh, my colleagues who work on the advocacy section of pretty much agree that this, the bill was drafted very, very tightly, much more so than previous anti-terrorism legislation. They've sort of been a lookout for loopholes, so it will be a huge fight. But let's say we bring this down or judicially review it at some point and some loopholes can be made. We do need to be mobilising around a completely different vision about what we need to completely reimagine. And there aren't easy solutions to that, but we must not get lost in the knee-jerk reactions and actually take our eyes off of the bigger picture or we'll forever be repeating this you know i'm 44 and i've been through this cycle a few times now and really that wouldn't be to sound too depressing it just seems to be a downward spiral and i'm as responsible as everybody else for helping create that because the work we do is firefighting it's not reimagining so i end with that call actually for a reimagination today of the university space because that's where we're speaking but you know with an eye on the fact that all these spaces interlink they interlink in the north to disenfranchise the south and as Fanon used to emphasize that line of the human that differentiates those two spheres is not one that's just geographical it exists within the north it exists within the south and we are seeing a literal enactment of that dehumanization today thanks <laughs>I have the opportunity to talk about in a public audience, so I would like to thank the organizer. Many attempts had been uh, censored, uh, either by the university I was working in 
or uh, either cancelled uh, outside the university. I raise the point because there is an articulation between, in one part, free speech uh, uh, statements, and on the other side, uh, Islamophob Islamophobic uh, uh, statements. Well, uh, the story began with uh, something that unfortunately you know also, that is the funding crisis of university and uh, many debates around uh, what are the values of, the, uh, of a university, what, can, what kind of organization uh, a university has to have, and related to, to those topics in parallel, uh, the rise of an Islamophobic uh, uh, um, discourse, speech. Well, how to define our, our values? by uh, bashing Islamic values. I, I, uh, je caricature, I, yeah, it's a caricature, but it's more or less, uh, well. Uh, my story began with the, uh, that uh, rise of that kind of, uh, uh, in one part, more and more invitation to Islamophob Islamophobic figure in the university I was working in, uh, L'Université Libre de Bruxelles, to, 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 to tell it. And on the other part, the censorship of uh, Muslim uh, scholars, uh, like, for instance, uh, Tariq Ramadan or other. And here I use the term uh, as Muslim in a sense of as a race, in fact, because uh, the, that sen the censorship of uh, people depicted as Muslim is not only the question of being or not a Muslim, but being depicted like a race, like a Muslim. For, for instance, I was depicted like a, the son of Ben Laden, but I have never made any statement whether or not I'm a Muslim. But because I, my family originated from Morocco, that enables the society to define me as a Muslim. Well. Uh, for when my university, my former university, invited uh, Caroline Forest, Caroline Forest, which is for many scholars and a, a part of uh, the population, a symbol of uh, Islamophobia. Uh, we, uh, by we I mean uh, around 100 of uh, uh, researchers, trade unionists, and uh, anti-racist activists, decided to call for a burqa bride. What is a burqa bride? A burqa bride was, as the university refused, we were not exactly asking for the censorship of Caroline Forest, we were asking for a contradictory debate instead of a tribune given, given by a university to uh, an Islamophobic figure. Uh, as the university refused uh, that uh, contradictory debate, we called uh, for uh, the audience to come to assist to, to, to the tribune wearing a scarf or a, 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 a burqa. The ironic uh, was that we asked that to men, not to women. Well, uh, that event was agreed by the management because I was working uh, for the university, so I had to ask the permission and the deal was as long as there is no violence, for sure you can. That was the day before. Uh, the day after, I was depicted in all, uh, and it's interesting, from a movement of 100 people, you have only one, uh, the, 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 the media uh, focused on me like a kind of guru. As you know, Muslim or barbaric, they, they can think if there is 100 people, that means they are following a kind of uh, a guru with the, uh, all the, 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 um, uh, the, the, le préjugé de préjugé, pré, 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 along that very beautiful term, if you have some uh, Indian uh, knowledge, that it is a guru. Uh, so, uh, when I mean, I, I was really depicted in the, the, one of the main newspapers of, the, the, of, Bel, of Belgium, uh, titled, uh, The Democracy Was Killed That Day. So that means uh, 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 Muslims integrist uh, has uh, uh, um, 
uh, uh, are against uh, uh, free speech, whereas instead we are asking to be part of the debate. Uh, well, uh, so what I would like to, to say here, to focus here, because uh, I, I have no... Uh, um, the, the issue is so critical that I'm afraid to be uh, uh, to, to 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 raise any misunderstanding because there is a lot in that history. Uh, but to focus in uh, 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 on many things, first one that Muslim wars like a race. When you say Muslim, you are not specifically speaking about uh, the belief only the belief that's part for sure, but also speaking of. Uh, Anyone, for instance, there is a more and more uh, uh, surveys in France and Belgium trying to assess the number of Muslims. How does it work? It only assesses people originated from countries of uh, a, a Muslim tradition. So, Muslim works like a race. Twice, uh, when you are figured like a Muslim, you are guilty by assumption. You, are, you have to demonstrate that you are not sexist, homophobic, uh, anti-speech, freedom, uh, and so on. Uh, it's, uh, Nadine, you speak about many people that choose to say, I am Charlie. Personally, I have chosen to say I'm not Charlie. And that's also the, the possibility when you are figured like a Muslim not to be uh, a good boy, but also to be critical, uh, to be part of con con uh, con contest political contestation. Uh, f third thing I would like to say, it's the violence when that kind of... Uh, uh, in French, we say psychose collective. I don't know how to say. Oh, yeah, collective psyche. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I don't like hysteria because there is a link with hysterics, and uh, they prefer to. Uh, yeah, collective. Collective. Consciousness. Consciousness. Yeah. Anyway, when you are depicted to be. Uh, to to uh, to be an integrist, uh, what is very what struck me that all uh, the uh, oh uh, in democracy that is uh, supposed to 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 protect you uh, law but also anti-racist association when uh, that kind of movement occurred all that is of of no help because once the TV said you are a terrorist who will dare to support you or even ask where are the proofs uh, so i would like to to focus on on, on two things the 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 um, uh, in uh, dans ce que parler veut dire which is a book of pierre bourdieu uh, i can translate it by what talking is about uh, he said that when there is, uh, as you know, language, language is polysemical. And uh, Bourdieu said that when you are uh, a tension, uh, a social tension between uh, people speaking, they tend to uh, understand what comfort, what strengths the, the, the vision they have of the other. I would say that it's the same uh, on racial, and I and I, I include uh, Muslim uh, uh, things. Uh, that means you have to be very, very, very careful when you are depicted like a Muslim. Uh, I will, uh, I will. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, we called our movement a burqa pride, and the, we were accused of being homophobic because pride. And uh, despite a uh, uh, figure like uh, Judith Butler supported us, we are still homophobic, you know? So it's very difficult when you have to prove that you are not anti-Semitic, you are not sexist, you are not... Yes, it's, it's, uh, uh, on top of that, I would say that there is something specific on the university. I think that really 
uh, university is one of the uh, uh, the field of racism because uh, I suppose you are well aware of a kind of um, uh, epistemic racism that uh, 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 that uh, focus only on uh, European knowledge. I would say white European knowledge. And uh, when that epistemic racism, which roots on modernity, meets uh, the political uh, um, uh, anti-crisis speeches, which racism is, that makes a very, very uh, uh, strong uh, uh, effect. Um, well, I would also, yeah, have two minutes. Oh. I would, uh, well, I, I would also maybe speak about, uh, uh, with, if I, uh, about the percolationary uh, effect of speeches of words, you know, the, the psycholo psychological charge words are. If you say Sharia or Burqa, uh, there is no more social science, there is no more rationality, and there is no more free speech, despite all that story is uh, 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 legitimated by free speech. Okay. It's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So finally, uh, we'll hear from uh, Malia Huatia uh, from the NUS. Um, it's not a kind of best to last um, thing, by the way. <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of, a lot of the points I've, I'll be making um, have been touched up on. Um, so I guess this is for the latecomers out there. Um, so hello and assalamu alaikum. Um, so I'd like to thank Sarah and Nadine for inviting me here today and for organising this much needed discussion. Um, I hope that we can all draw upon, um, upon you know, the points made in our own work and respective fields and that my contribution today can um, be of some small benefit in our efforts to fight Islamophobia. So for those of you who don't know about the NUS Black Students Campaign, we are a self-organized autonomous group, liberation, one of the four liberation campaigns within the National Union of Students. Um, and we represent over a million students of African, Asian, Arab, um, Caribbean and South American descent from further to higher education across the UK. Uh, we work on increasing black representation for, for an equal, accessible and decolonized education uh, on anti-racism and anti-fascism and uh, against all forms of imperialism and colonialism. Our campaign was created to confront inequalities such as the threats posed by anti-Muslim racism um, and has long stood in active opposition to all forms of Islamophobia as we recognize it as an integral part of the anti-racist struggle. Today I'll be speaking on issues relating to free speech and Islamophobia, as well as um, racism more generally with regards to um, the on-campus context. Because for a while now, free speech or freedom of speech has, has been a highly discussed topic within the student movement, though unfortunately not always with the best of intentions. Free speech, as we understand it, is one of the number of freedoms, including the right of expression, um, and the right to organize, which form an integral part of the democratic process, and especially our ability to speak truth to power and hold it to account. These were all freedoms earned, gained, or rather taken uh, through struggle, and our freedoms we protect in order to defend our right to fight against oppression from the state and its institutions. It's something we fight for because as oppressed groups in society is especially important for us even if in reality free speech has never been a privilege enjoyed by black or Muslim people here, which history has proven many times over. This may be old news to um, many of you sitting in this room, but I bring it up because this is often something lost in the discussions around free speech in universities. 
any considerations of power dynamics, oppression and liberation is usually out of the question. The curtailment of freedoms for many years under the guise of um, counterterrorism remains a niche point of discussion. Most commonly, when free speech does emerge as an issue among students, it comes from the most privileged quarters, usually white, uh, usually men, um, on an apparent crusade to defend their God-given right to be racist, sexist, homophobic, or grossly offensive, and who wish to exercise this right without taking any responsibility of it. Um, and concerningly, this seems to be a trend reaching beyond the student level and beyond the UK, even as the whole, you know, Je suis Charny uh, debacle earlier this year showed, where the discussion centered around the heroic work of Charlie Hebdo, uh, despite its clearly problematic and often deeply offensive nature. Sometimes the discourse was divorced even further from the political, and so many, uh, so for many, there was no contradiction to see the likes of François Hollande um, or Benjamin Netanyahu at Je suis Charlie demonstrations. There didn't even seem to be any contention between David Cameron's passionate defense of Charlie Hebdo and free speech in one breath and his promises to clamp down on civil liberties to maintain security in the next. Um, or even when the persecution of anti-Zionist uh, and or anti-establishment activists in France in the immediate aftermath of Charlie Hebdo reached almost parody levels. The depoliticization of the concept of free speech has allowed for it to be used to perpetuate Islamophobia because free speech is just seen as the right to say anything to anyone without consequence. Whilst Islamophobia has resurged and Muslim people are attacked from all angles with the state and the media all chipping in, the right to be able to insult their faith is seen as more important than the need to challenge the dangerous prevailing discourse surrounding Muslims. So now with regards to the Counterterrorism uh, counter and Security Act, I think that by now it's become painfully clear um, that this act, what this act represents, which is the greatest threat to civil liberties in a generation and a signifier of the British government's steady descent into a police state and state fascism. It proposes a number of measures that build upon nearly two decades of previous anti-extremism legislation that has served to legitimize mass surveillance and erode people's civil liberties in the UK. Bringing this back to spaces of education, the part of the act which has received the most attention is placing the government's prevent strategy on a statutory basis. So making it a legal requirement for public bodies such as universities to implement it. And as, as of July the 1st this year, institutions will be expected to comply with the statutory advice in actively monitoring students for signs of radicalization or extremism. Um, with the prevent strategies literature saying flat out that Al-Qaeda Al inspired Islamic terrorism is the most significant threat to Britain. There is no way that this cannot be interpreted as putting primarily Muslims under the microscope and by extension, all non-white people. Uh, broad opposition to the act is much needed, but the problem has been that the mainstream discourse against it does often miss the point over just why prevent has been so destructive to Muslim and black communities, largely because of a disproportionate focus on freedom of speech which I've explained has been divested of its political motivation alongside other politically neutral arguments such as student welfare, which pose the meekest possible challenge to the government. The popular argument uh, leveraged against the act is that putting the duty to prevent extremism flourishing on campuses by monitoring extremist speakers um, could cause conflict on issues to do with free speech, which universities already have a positive duty to protect, which is true. Uh, but this neglects the deeper and more insidious aspect of PREVENT and the systematic nature of Islamophobia. It neglects um, that the PREVENT initiative is an attempt to reconfigure and engineer the entire foundation of Islamic faith in Britain to state-sponsored, uh, unthreatening version, to a state-sponsored, unthreatening version in line with so-called British values. It ignores that the violence of Islamophobia uh, includes the physical, but also the epistemic, where Muslims find themselves categorized into Eurocentric uh, dichotomies, which Nadine touched up on, of the good Muslim, bad Muslim, uh, or Islamism versus passive faith in Islam. When speaking just of free speech, we can, we can overlook the arrogance of um, 
of British foreign policy leading it to kill Muslims and black people around uh, abroad and then pathologize discontent from Muslims and black people here when what Prevent really marks is the UK government's absolute refusal to accept culpability for political violence in response to their own actions. And free speech doesn't engage um, with the injustice facing black students within a Western education system that has thrived off the silencing and destruction of indigenous knowledge systems under empire and which is now expected to police students who critique or challenge it um, as an affront to British values, i.e. imperial imperial arrogance. And this is one of the many hypocrisies of a nation intoxicated by its colonial legacy, yet unwilling to accept the consequences of that history. With free speech now reduced to an individualist uh, liberal goal, opposition to the act has remained self-centered, uh, self-interested. Academics naturally want to cover their backs in defending academic freedom and Muslims have to do what they can to survive here. The left has been locked in internal discussions and hasn't really actively confronted the issue of Islamophobia, rather wasting time legitimizing arguments on what constitutes Islamophobia, what Islamophobia really looks like, uh, what Muslims are acceptable to make allegiances with, uh, and so on, and actually helping scaffold the government's rhetoric. What is needed now is the strongest and most unified principled opposition on the basis that it gets no worse than this. Reviving the political nature of free speech um, and placing it back alongside the wider struggles against oppression, not a goal in and of itself. Thank you. Does anyone uh, have any questions? I think there's one. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, if, and this is an open question to all the panel members, and I just wanted to know if, um, if the panel knew um, any historical, historically popular grassroots political movements or organisations who have organised and affected change in society with which we who want to fight Islamophobia can learn from. And if so, can any of the panel members outline any specific strategies or tactics of these groups which a movement against Islamophobia can replicate? Okay, so I'm charged with that one first and uh, not happily because I went into a bit of a, a kind of blind spot when you, when you raised the question. I think there are many, many movements uh, we can learn from, whether it's the civil rights movement in the 60s and 50s and 60s and whatever in the US, uh, whether it's uh, movements for gay liberation, whether it's movements for, even for women's liberation, with all the kind of uh, qualifications I would put on the latter two in terms of them being assimilated into a discourse of oppression. And I mean, there's not really a meeting to unpack all of that, but I think there's a very pertinent critique. But what I am concerned about is the idea that actually there has been success. I think there's been movements forward and then movements back. And the movement backs come from the socialization of those movements. So in a way, oftentimes I still hear friends in the States saying we live you know, in a post-racial society, the big sort of proof of which being having a black president. And I mean, people are still saying this even after this year of the exposure of the police brutality and institutionalization of anti-black hatred, okay? The very kind of obvious in your face hatred that we can now see very clearly in front of us on social media. And I think for us, our consciousness has to be, okay, what were the successes of the movements? But really, what were the failures? Because they've been curtailed, they've been stopped. You know, the actual process of liberation hasn't actually come to fruition. And uh, I think it's worth reading the work of someone like Kwame Namaku, who talks about uh, enslavement. He won't even use the word slavery, but he talks about enslavement and the legacy we have of the transatlantic slave trade. And he says, okay, we've had emancipation, but we actually haven't had liberation, and we've lost sight of this. We keep looking at the fact that there's been emancipation, and we keep being told we've been emancipated. He actually famously says that, you know, if there hadn't been slavery, the British would have invented it just to say that they'd abolished it, because they love repeating it. 
you know, we actually have to focus on that rather than what has happened. It may be good, but it might be just something on the journey. Yeah. Um, so, like, coming from um, a black liberation point of view, I guess, um, naturally self-organization for me is key, particularly with regards to fighting Islamophobia, just because it, it stems from ultimately from anti-blackness. Um, and I think it's important for us not to see it as uh, removed from um, wider anti-racist movements and, and movements of liberation because this is a continuation of racism. Um, it's, it's, it's not this new thing that we kind of have to like reorganize around necessarily, it's, but rather redirect those skills and energy as well to, to kind of collectively fight this as well. And I think the problem often as well, um, wh when I talk about and, and preach on about self, the importance of self-organization is then it's um, the issue of Islamophobia is dumped on the Muslims. So it's just their issue. And no, we're being respectful. We're supporting liberation by like just leaving the Muslims to get on with it. That, that's, that's not what we're saying. Um, whilst that element, whilst the element is important, and the understanding of like privileges within those space of organizing, understanding um, who that the oppressed have to be the ones to define their oppression and therefore make those de the demands for their liberation as well. Um, it's important that we all take a responsibility in it, just as we all have a hand in perpetuating like um, you know structural barriers, all forms of structural barriers. Um, we need to all be involved in some way. Naturally, I can say you know, for, for black students to come and join the Black Students Campaign and support our work on the ground, Islamic Human Rights Commission, um, CAGE, I mean, so many organizations and groups, uh, but really mobilize within your own space in some way. There doesn't necessarily need to be this, this kind of like big national organization to lead you. Um, it could be picked up anywhere. And like as you said, whilst we can be inspired by past movements, it's also really important to see what went wrong and to learn from that. And our previous um, mobilizations around prevent or lack of, um, our, you know, w when it first kind of uh, was established or legitimized through institutions, um, are, 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 are a classic example of that. And I think, w what is it that we didn't do? Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Well, Islamophobia is, is not new. It has uh, 500 years and it roots in modernity, but also in capitalism. So I think there is two tactics, two main tactics. First, for scholars to decolonize the science, and uh, twice for the social, uh, the civil society to think Islamophobia has a, a, f a phenomenon of domination. If you look to Islamophobia, as a kind of domination, which is uh, an occurrence, an example, that you can articulate with uh, and take also lessons for, as you said, uh, gay liberation, feminist movement and things. And, and we need also to articulate what is, what is, we have to, uh, to elaborate and to answer, to address the issue. Why a white, non-Muslim men has to fight against Islamophobia. As long as it is only a moral assessment that you mean, okay, uh, 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 I, I am against Islamophobia because by solidarity or thing, uh, you, you, that's a very good thing for sure, but you like something. And what you like is that Islamophobia is part of the, the domination organization of the world. I would like to say thank you for your wonderful and um, uh, expository speech uh, regarding uh, Muslims and the injustices they suffer. However, I would want uh, some sort of clarification here. If I'm wrong, um, I obviously expect you to correct me. It is very disheartening to see people being hated for the sheer fact that they belong to a specific uh, religious persuasion. I'm not Muslim personally, but I have cause to sympathize in a sense with this um, uh, degrading uh, sense of uh, that, that degrading approach uh, 
more so from a Western society where they are meant to be seen as people who have championed the cause of good values the world over. But as this unfolds, uh, from what you've just said, as the example suggests, it seems the contrary. However, I have one question for you. Uh, I've so far um, discovered from your speech that it is so much about the hatred uh, you've suffered, uh, perhaps as a Muslim or as a non-Muslim, probably as an academic who has his or her own views on Islamophobia. I've seen, I've been able to um, um, decipher one thing about your speech, and that is the hate uh, Muslims suffer um, in an attempt to occupy this space where they're meant to air their views. Would you draw, would you like to, would you say it's right to draw a distinction between Muslims who are law abiding and by virtue of this freedom of expression are not using it as a cover up for promoting <coughs> inciting speeches? Would you like to draw a line between Muslims who are well meaning, uh, would not abuse the privilege of free speech and those who use the cover of Islam for promoting anarchy. After all, public security is, 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 is of the essence. You know, people need to be safe, you know, from, so I don't know what you have to say regarding that. Okay, sure. Who, um, who was the question directed at, just to clarify? It could be anyone. Okay. As, as long as I get clarification, sure. yes. Shall we take another question and then yeah. go back? Yep. I think that gentleman, yep. Uh, the Counterterrorism Act. Uh, those who must report from schools and universities will report inevitably because if they don't report, the consequences to themselves can be terrible. But those who are reported on as students, what is not clear is that inevitably they go on a watch list or blacklist for life, for the rest of their life they will never come off that blacklist. And one might draw an analogy of union workers in the construction industry, white union workers in England, who went on a blacklist and sub subsequently spent the rest of their life on very precarious employment. They have now been <coughs> in a court case, which they won. There has now been a compensation fund set up. But to return to what I speak of, so those students who remain on this watch list, what happens to them after they have finished university and they realize that one, they will be blacklisted out of certain jobs and two, things build upon things. What will those students, those graduates become? What will they think? I'm a blacklist for life, I'm on a blacklist for life. What is the path that they might follow? Um, just very briefly on the initial question, um, I mean, at least what I was trying to say through talking about this idea of liberal Islamophobia, the, divide, the dividing that takes place between there are good Muslims and there are bad Muslims is, is I think that it's actually quite a convenient optic um, to, to um, paint the community that, is tr that, it, that the government wants to police in that way. Um, because it acts as a justification for forms of surveillance, also scapegoating and control, and also a huge distraction um, from, say, um, as Malia talked about, um, foreign policy or, or other things that might be contributing to, say, radicalization. Um, it, it also um, feeds into this idea that you can prevent radicalization. There's actually no, um, although racial profiling takes place in a particular community, is um, assumed to be guilty by just being um, a particular community, having a particular religion, there's actually no path to radicalization or actually b engaging in extremist behavior. So having extremist ideas or even thinking certain thoughts actually doesn't necessarily lead to any actually activity. But there's this myth that it can do and that it does and therefore we need to police. And so actually you're just enacting 
racist policing on a particular community. And of course, that acts as a very convenient um, way for the government to deflect attention um, from, this, from the other reels of society that there are many, a very unpopular austerity agenda, for instance. Um, so you're deflecting attention um, from that onto um, particular communities, whether you want to demonize the Muslim community or the migrant community um, or the poor. Um, so I guess that's what I'd say on that. Um, very briefly on the second question on blacklisting, it's not actually very clear at the moment how the um, Counterterrorism Security Act is going to operate in terms of how it's actually going to be operationalized on campuses. Um, in September, there should be more clarity when the government puts, uh, puts into statutory form um, its definition of extremism and what exactly the legal duty is going to be on specified authorities. So it will be a bit clearer then, but you're absolutely right that the demonization that takes place at every stage of, of your life, of course, um, um, has a ripple effect in every aspect of your life. So not just when you're at university, but also after, um, and even when you leave this institution and go and interact with another state institution. Um, that kind of institutionalized Islamophobia that we're seeing with the co-option of all these different spaces through which um, ra these ra racialized communities move, um, the same r result of oppression. So I think it's, yeah, it's, it's a, a good, good question. Uh, yeah, I, I guess like just on those points of, um, it's, it's also having to reject um, the, the, the systems that are offered to us or rather Let's say if, if we look at the police or um, the prison industrial complex, all those things, we, we have to be talking about the alternative. So not like taking the methods that the state has offered to us as being the only methods. So how do we see the good from the bad? Well, actually, th th their methods are incredibly problematic, uh, flawed, and, and, um, and there to kind of like perpetuate those, those forms of oppression and, and, and hierarchies across society. So. Um, I think it's also really thinking about the alternative, as, as, as Arzu put it, rather than like y using these methods, um, thinking that they're ultimately there for good, that they're not there for good. They're there to kind of like maintain a status quo. They're there to kind of, yeah, to keep things in place um, for a privileged few in society. So I guess, yeah, thinking about the alternative is quite important. Um, and as for uh, the aspect of like, uh, the, the blacklisting, um, it, it, it's happened in dribs and drabs. When we look at particularly uh, the targeting of uh, committee members of Islamic societies across campuses, um, lives have been ruined, even those with like, um, where, where there's, been, there's actually been no convictions. I mean, not only the psychological trauma of having to go through um, you know, the humiliation, uh, the legal battles, whatever. Uh, and this is, you know, outside of CTS. So now with its implementation, God only knows how far it's going to take it. I mean, you've got peers over there, one of the vice presidents at NUS as well. When he was at Bradford College, he was required to like give in, constantly send in the names of like committee members um, uh, within Islamic societies and, and, you know, didn't have like prior knowledge of, of like the prevent strategy or what was actually taking place on a state level, but thought this is a bit dodgy. What, why is it that they don't want names of other, um, you know, of any other society or group organizing why this particular one? So it's, it's collectively having to be critical. And I guess when the time comes as well, having to mobilize around that, whether it's legally or, or in any other form politically uh, within, within education spaces and society as a whole, um, we shouldn't wait for like things to be clarified in terms of how they're going to actively target. We need to be challenging it from the get-go anyway. Right, to, to briefly answer the, the two questions, the first one, someone who is stealing a bicycle is a thief. When uh, you begin to uh, address the issue by uh, saying uh, something about the gender or the class or the race or the religion, there be begins the, 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 an ideology of domination. I mean, all, the, all this is about democracy. What is democracy? Democracy is uh, a way to uh, battle for contradictory projects peacefully, as peacefully as it could be. That means that if you are Muslim and you would like to install a caliphate in London, what's, where's the problem as long as you are peaceful? That's democracy. You are not obliged to vote for him. You are not obliged to share 
his dreams. For, for myself, I'm, I'm radical, I'm anti-capitalist and radical. I like radicality. I, 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 I claim for the, the right to be radical. I'm a radical scholarship and I'm a radical activist, but I'm peaceful. But the, the second question, when, when you are blacklisted, uh, fortunately, I, I had to, to, to move from Belgium to France to, to go on, on my research. Uh, and I have to thank uh, fr many French scholars that helped me to, to be hired in a French university. Uh, which leads me to conclude that uh, there is no individual answer to Islamophobia or any kind of domination or oppression, only uh, 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 collective discussions where the key point is solidarity. Uh, if I try and briefly just touch on both of those, the second one first. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about whether it will go to a watch list, but it's likely, as you said, it's been done with trade unionists and so on. We've seen the history of it. But that question of what will become of these people, I'm not saying you're implying this, but this often has been an argument in uh, people genuinely trying to, to contest the anti-terrorism laws of the last 15 or so years in which there will be an argument that you know, if you disenfranchise people, if you marginalize them, you know, you're pushing them more towards the extreme that you're trying to avoid. And I think that's also actually part of a distracting narrative because we've actually been here in terms of uh, disenfranchisement and marginalization and everything else before, not necessarily through the blacklisting processes, whether it's the unions or whether it's to do with uh, so-called radical Muslims or not that radical Muslims actually. Many of the people I know have been targeted, quite frankly, I don't think could, you know, blow a balloon over, but anyway, um, if you read Tariq Modud when he was talking about, uh, or, or doing his work about the employment statistics, the uh, aspir educational levels and aspirational levels of Pakistani and Bangladeshi men from the 60s, 70s and 80s into the 90s, he highlights the fact that so many are either taxi drivers or working in catering, this is including people who are born and brought up in the United Kingdom, why is that? because despite going to university, despite going through the system here, they are discriminated against at such a level that they cannot do anything except work for themselves, really, or work in something like catering. You know, we have kind of families running uh, restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, and employing people, you know, in the wider circle of the family. So what you have are communities that are already marginalized. They've already been through this, and they don't become violent. Uh, they become depressed, actually, quite a lot of the time you know, on a mass level. And there's actually quite a body of work in the United States about the effects of both structural racism and internalized racism, because that's another thing that we face, the fact that the continuous narrative, and this is something my colleague, uh, Sayed Reza Amali, calls the domination hate model of intercultural relations, the idea that actually intercultural relations is not on, you know, me as a Muslim and you as, you know, the white state having an equal conversation. It's about the white state dominating me as a Muslim and communities who are Muslims, who are black, who are racialized in different, different ways. Sorry, I realize I'm prattling on a bit too much here. But that body of work in the US is worth looking at because it will then highlight the kind of internalized violence that we start enacting on ourselves rather than on anybody else. So it's worth kind of looking into where we're going because it's already happened so many times before. With regard to your question, I think it's important for all of us, and I stand accused as well of this, of, of being wary of the questions we are always being asked by, you know, the institutions of the state. So, you know, do you condemn terrorism? You know, are you for free speech? What about women in Islam, to which these days in my kind of cantankerous old age, I really like to say, well, what about women in Islam? What about it, you know? We have to stop, re you know, repeating the questions. Yes, we're not all perfect people or perfect communities, but the questions we're being forced to answer are not re the real questions, you know, and we're all being divided by them as well because then we all start fighting with each other. What about black-on-black -black violence? What about rioting? You know, I mean, at the time of the riots in 2011, I was rather surprised by the amount of Muslim organizations or leaders individually who are condemning the riots based on the media coverage when actually, you know, we have a very heightened sense, we've done a lot of research on this as an organization, of understanding Islamophobic media production and reproduction. How is it we're believing the same media when they're talking about rioters as being black youth? You know, you should be able to decode this beyond your own personal experience 
So yes, be wary of the questions. We need different questions. I don't know if this is a good question, but um, if you have someone close to you who tends to have um, Islamophobic ways of thinking and opinions, like that all oh, Muslims are uh, dangerous or that Islam is a harmful religion as a whole, um, what do you think that we should do to, to teach them so that they can think better? They're not a bad person, they're just very close-minded. How should we teach them that it's not that way? Okay, and then uh, there was one just behind. Yep. Uh, hi there. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Thank you very much for your efforts. Um, <coughs> I have a few questions. Uh, first of all, uh, from my perspective, uh, this is a psychological warfare. It's just trying to scare people, scare us from our faith. I feel like I'm being, you know, bothered sometimes, uh, you know, I get into thoughts about these kind of issues, you know, because we know, I mean, all the sources, are con it, all these enemies uh, who are causing this kind of terrorist attacks and stuff like that, scholars have spoken against them, uh, but we never hear that in the media. We've had the, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Abdullah, Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Abdullah, who spoke about uh, ISIS. He gave a, f an, a religious edict against ISIS. I don't know if anyone here heard of this. In 2014, June 2014. And he called them enemies, and he called uh, enemies of Islam, and he and he called and he said that some of these people are, uh, uh, they are handled or they are fed at the pens of intelligence agencies. I uh, I have come across an issue where one of these recruiters came to a picnic we had for a mosque, and he come and try and talk to the the, the young man to go to jihad. So we rebutted him with the uh, proofs from the Quran, and 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 and, uh, and, and you know, the t religious prophet, uh, religious teachings from the prophet, and we told them what he's doing is wrong. We tried to get him away from this issue, uh, and he left our picnic. A few months later, uh, he stitched up 17 young men from another area, another mosque, and this is it was in Canadian news. This is a few years ago, and it was the same guy, and he ended up being an agent, test agent who was outed in the media and all these things. So it's a vicious cycle, you know, they're feeding, them, they're feeding the fuel, so they scare people, and then have the, you know, have people panic, give away your freedoms and your rights. These laws are brought in and not for Muslims only. At the end of the day, once the law comes here, once the law, come, uh, once the law is enacted here, it's for everyone. Whether you're Muslim, whether you're non-Muslim. You know, any oppression that is used in the name of Islam will eventually uh, extend to everyone else. But my question is, how will these people not stop? They are known to the intelligence agencies. The guys who uh, murdered the, the drummer, uh, uh, Lee Rigby, they were turned out to be known by the intelligence agencies. How come they were not, why weren't they stopped by the intelligence agencies? How much laws do they need in order for them to do their jobs properly? Because they say, oh, this is the guys, we've caught them, and then, oh, but we can't, uh, and some of the extremist speakers, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chaudhry or something, for instance, Every day he's speaking something uh, inflammatory. So nobody's saying anything. Nobody's going against him, you know. And they come and look for young men and, and women in schools, you know, who are getting critical thinking, training critical thinking, or, or trying to exchange their ideas. And we have to report them and, and get them blacklisted. So why are the authorities uh, not doing anything? This is bottom line. And what, where okay. can we get the platform to speak against these kind of issues? Because the media seems sealed off for us. We <laughs> can't get our ideas there. So, I mean, I don't know what your take on that is. I think in terms of, like, this aspect, uh, whenever something, an event takes place, there's always, like, the look towards the Muslim community to say something, speak up. Uh, I personally dealt with, like, a few attacks um, because I was Muslim in a political kind of, like, role. Um, and, and, you know, it was in line with, like, ISIS stories and the fact that, you know, I, I, I have so much power that I led the National Union of Students to support ISIS and um, to, 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 say, to state that if, if you condemn them or criticize them in any way, you are all Islamophobic. Um, but anyway, so I did that all on my own. And um, from that, even like, you know, organizations that you would, from the left, who you'd, who, who you'd think would like understand that this is a continuation of like, you know, um, um, it, this is a continued kind of like events in history. Um, we're, we're also trying to pressure me saying, you know, say, just, just, just tweet one line, just post one something saying you, you definitely are 100% against ISIS. And it's like, well, if I was a Muslim woman, why would I have to do that? I wouldn't have to do that, would I? 
but because I am, because of my identity and because it is uh, racialized as such and, and it's so like problematic coming out of my mouth in particular in comparison to let's say a, a white woman in my position then, um, well, technically could never, she couldn't be the black students officer, but um, you know, in, in a kind of political role that I have to, and you know, and this is this came namely from within my own community as well, where the, the fear just overcame, they were so scared of the consequences, they didn't want harm to come to me, they said just, just, just give them what they want, which is that you are 100% opposed to ISIS. I, I don't, even right now, I don't need to justify that, and I don't need to talk about that, um, because it's also not, not leading to the root of the problem, but I think uh we don't need to be calling for the media to kind of like platform our like communities con condemnation of such acts because again it's not looking to the root of the problem why is such um violence enacted why does it exist that's what we should be looking at those are the the, the, the solutions that we should be working towards um and i think I may end up rambling, so I'm going to pass on the mic. <laughs> I think I, large, I agree with a lot of what Malia said, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it that rather than address that question. With regard to the, uh, the person who was asking about the, their friend or close uh, relative, I forget now, who, who just can't stand Muslims or Islam, one of the things about the domination hate model that I was talking about, uh, Professor Amelie came up with, and it took me a bit of a while to stomach it when he first sort of posited it, because by nature I tend to be, you know, I grew up in North London in the 70s and 80s and had to kind of confront the kind of physical reality of the National Front marching, you know, just nearby and being very physically threatening. I tend to be, or tended to be, the person who would be, you know, at least verbally in your face. And he argues that actually, whether it's, you know, the Britain First type or the, even the liberal Islamophobes of the middle classes, etc., or even people who perpetrate hate, you know, hate crimes and hate attacks, they're also, in a way, victims of Islamophobia and racism. And the reason he argues for that is that domination hatred is a top-down thing. It comes through political discourse. It comes through media reproduction. It comes through the laws and the, the mutuality between those institutions and how they repro reproduce inequality. And the majority population is ultimately being fed that. They're being brought up in that culture of hatred, of domination, they don't actually, in that sense, know or have the agency that they think they have. And it's made me think a, long, a lot about this question, about how you deal with this. I don't know how. I haven't had any practical experience. I've seen many things. It's worth looking online of a Britain First member who's now completely left Britain First. And the process he went through, it's, I think it's a press TV video. There are things like this. It's worth looking into. I, I couldn't practically suggest something, but I think what I'm saying unusually is not to be despondent and not to kind of give up hope because once we realize that this is also an outcome, you can start kind of, uh, if you like, looking for ways to bring people out of it. Ultimately, what we do as individuals, we do it you know, out of love and on a moral basis, but whether it's you know, showing that Muslims are good as a Muslim or trying to persuade an Islamophobe, however, this is, again, the things we do as individuals, but that's not going to change the system, which is, again, the big question that we have to, to look at. I will not repeat. Okay, well, we've actually run over. So um, uh, just before we thank our speakers, um, I wanted to invite you all to all of the other Law on Trial sessions, which are happening every night this week at Birkbeck. Uh, details are online. So thanks very much, and let's thank our speakers. Thank you.